At first, I started writing down ideas for this video thinking it would just be a quick little list and then a rough idea for what I would want their first mini album to sound like. But you guys know me, I couldn't be satisfied with just one mini album idea, no. We need excruciating details, I need to pre-plan their entire career almost. Two things before we begin, the first is a humble request to check out the resources in the description and see how you can help the people of Palestine, Lebanon, Yemen, Congo, Sudan, and Haiti. The second is far, far less important, but just letting you guys know that you can still submit your responses for the Island 2 form. We're about halfway to 300 responses, which is my goal because that means we have a good sample size. I can't make this intro too long because the video will be long enough as it is, so let's just jump straight into part one. The first three title tracks are crucial to establishing what you can expect from the group. Kepler had to find out the hard way and they lost a lot of popularity early on by not focusing on these first releases. I think their best bet to both stand out from Kepler, Eyes One, Meow, 21, and Blackpink would be to lead into either Latin pop influences like Bandit's Dumb or Idol's Han. Or to just fully commit to more Arabic inspirations like I've in Eleven and Love Dive. And house like FX's Butterfly and GWS and Tweaks. We don't need an elaborate concept or a lore or expensive sets and styling, just something consistent. A good way to separate them from YG is also by avoiding their classic rich bitch vibe and concept. I also think they would benefit from some jazz and R&B inspirations to really let Jiyoon's vocal tone shine and stand out from the rest of 5th gen. What we need is something where you just know this is Izna. And none of that, they're so versatile, they change genres every comeback and it's about exploring different selves or whatever. Look at your most successful acts in the last 3-4 to four years. When we don't consider the hype of it all, you have a commonality between them. La Seraphim, New Jeans, Kiss of Life, Espa, Ive, etc. They all came out the gate with a strong identity and the comeback or two that built on that. La Seraphim came out with Fearless and followed up with Anti-Fragile and Unforgiven. Each of those builds on the same foundation and they probably would have kept going strong were it not for their own lacking skills and people seeing an easy target in it. Not to say they're in any way unsuccessful now, but they quickly fell from general grace whether you believe that's on them or not. With New Jeans, it's a bit harder because each of their songs almost gets treated like a title track and comeback because almost all of them are promoted at different times. But let's look at main titles. From Attention to Oh My God to Super Shy, we have again a similar foundation and all saw great success. Kiss of Life came out of nowhere and established a very distinct identity through Shh, Bad News, and Midas Touch, but they recognize that their 90s hip hop slash R&B inspiration, like in Sugarcoat, resonates with people the most, although they try varying genres alongside it. Espa are kind of an outlier in that they tend to have a strong release and then some something that blows it out of the water and then repeat, but from Black Mamba to Next Level and then Savage to crown it off, they told you exactly what you could expect from them. And I've had probably one of the most legendary runs with Eleven, Love Dive, and Afterlife. My theory is that I Am and the accompanying full-length album was meant to close that chapter of their music, which is why Batty and Heya have more in common with Kitsch than their first releases. We might get one more comeback along these lines from them, and then another full-length, just my theory. But basically, through these solid releases, all of these groups made sure they are A, distinct from the rest of their peers, B, distinct from their seniors both within their companies and the industry as a whole, and C, became groups you can trust to listen to because if you like the last release, chances are you'll like the next one and vice versa. This is how you build a fan base. Constant genre shifting does much more to alienate new fans than people give it credit for. As much as I love them, Billy really did themselves a disservice going from King Coming Yo to seemingly trend chasing with Ring My Bell. Today, groups face even more scrutiny with regards to how well they stand out and whether they have a real identity or if they're just trend chasing. A few groups I think fall outside of this three strike system are Baby Monster, who will always have an audience because YG stands are the original K-pop cult, I will not hear any arguments on this. Eyelid as well, I think they'll have their make it or break it moment with their comeback, especially with them being dragged into the Hive conflict, but I think they'll always have an audience and I think Hive will try to guarantee their success to win a battle in their war. We also saw Itzy and Stacy fall victim to the second comeback rule as well as Idol. It's to release Dalla Dalla, Icy, and Wannabe back to back, all smashes, then start to lose momentum with every release after that. 
It seems they're just clawing their way back now, especially returning as OT5. Stacy also had a great run with So Bad, ASAP, and Stereotype, but the minute they tried something new with Run to You and Beautiful Monster, people turned on them. Then Idol are probably the strangest case because they've always been consistently popular, but they had smashes with Latata and Han, and then slipped with Senorita and Uh Oh, which is an actual crime. Uh Oh is so good. Post Queendom, we had Oh My God and a huge spike in international audiences, Dumdi Dumdi, which was far more of a hit in Korea than internationally, Hua and the Sujin scandal came back stronger than ever and smashed every chart like never before with Tomboy, then Nude, then Queen Card, and Super Lady didn't do that great, but Fate came out of nowhere and took over the charts, and then they released Klaxon, which wasn't a hit domestically or internationally, so I don't think they're done, but Idol are great proof of the rule of threes in a way. But you know who's great proof that consistency is key? Oh my girl. They came out of Queendom and took over the summer in April, which it is rare that a song of the summer comes out that early. Somehow spent the rest of the year in Japan before returning in May 2021 with another smash summer hit, but then they had competition from Roland and then Brave Girls branded themselves as summer queens. And when Oh My Girl tried to return with a chill summer bop in 2022 and 2023, they failed. The songs are good, but because they would just disappear from the Korean music industry for a whole year, people lost interest and their titles weren't interesting enough to gain it back. All this to say, the key to longevity is mass appeal that translates into dedicated fan bases. The key to mass appeal translating into fan bases is consistency. In an industry as saturated as K-pop, that means standing out to the point where when people hear your songs, they immediately recognize them. And when they hear a song like it, they'll think of you in a good way. Kind of the eyes one effect. We all know what an eyes one song sounds like, even if it's not an eyes one song. So again, Wake One and the Black Label need to make sure Izuna is a group like that. If they lean into songs like I Will Always Love You and Fake It, that would give them a really unique musical identity and especially set them apart from Blackwing and Eyes One, who they will always be compared to. But that style on its own won't be enough to divert attention their way. I personally would probably put a group with music like that high on my likability list, but you need strong releases to grab attention. I think their best bet would be songs with either a Latin slash Moombathon bass or Middle Eastern slash Indian elements. For this, I have prepared a sample of what I would want their discography to sound like. You had to have known it was coming. Now, you know I love a naming thing. I will promote them no matter what. The only naming themes I dislike are when K-pop groups do the the discovery of the unknown part one into the rabbit hole of Mirage beginning. Like, that's just a bunch of words. That tells me nothing. I like themes. Like what Aizuan, Luna, and Itzy did. My one exception is Billy because their album titles may just be a bunch of words but they work for the lore and concept. Originally, It's Me popped into my head because Izna. But then I remembered that's an Itzy album title and we should avoid unnecessary comparisons to them given the name. So then I figured it could work for them to do some kind of scene one type of deal, which granted is pretty overdone in today's K-pop landscape. I think I prefer the classic act one structure, which yes, just straight up stealing that from Gugudan. But it's been six years. I think someone else should be allowed to use it by now. But we're gonna do Roman numerals because they're a bit more versatile. So their first release, we need something big. We need a good impact here. We're calling it Act 1 Dramatic Tension. We're doing a visual aesthetic focus, not a storyline focus. But again, we're not leaning into what we've seen from previous YG acts. I'll get into it more in a bit. But we're going to lean into a Latin-esque vibe with a bit of an Arabic slash Desi influence style and more R&B based genres in B-sides. You know I love a good intro. We're giving them intros. I need them to have good intros. So our first intro is actually Sujin's Flowering, but we're renaming it Prologue Blooming. It has a nice stripped back vibe with some bossa nova elements which will build nicely into the overall vibe of the album. I could also hear the vocals in the track being performed by Jungin, which I think is a good reward for her first rank. As for title track, we will be using Bandit's Dramatic as our bass. Originally, I wanted to use Dumb, but I realized something. I cannot think of a single group that had a successful debut with a breakup song. Love songs or self-love songs, plenty of examples, but debuting with a breakup song just feels like getting off on the wrong foot. It's in line with the most successful songs from the show, but it's also a lot easier for young girls to sell a song about love rather than a breakup. So Dramatic has a lot more tropical elements to it than exactly what I wanted, but I prefer it as a bass because it also has the lyrical content I would want. So just imagine a mix of Dramatic and Dumb and you have 
have what I actually want from their debut. Something strong, a bit on the elegant side with an allowance for strong choreos. In my mind, I do see the glamour shots as being references to old movies with maybe a bit of a western feel, a little bit like Not Shy meets Pixie's Karma. Following that, we have Stellar's Archangels of the Sephiroth. We're calling it Sephiroth Angel. Now, hear me out. It has exactly that kind of guitar riff that I wanted to include, and it has great potential as a performance-focused song where the vocals don't need to be carried by Jungun and Jiyoon, so they can also participate in the choreo fully. I would want this to be a surprise pre-debut KCON performance because it needs that big sage to be understood. Then they bring it to Mama and show off even more. It's not necessarily meant to be a song you listen to without the visuals to enhance it. It's a live performance song. Now, building onto this soft, dark, elegant vibe, we have FX's Butterfly to introduce another side to their sound, the more electronic house elements. This gives them a versatility angle they can build off of while, again, not forcing Jiyun or Jungin to carry the group vocally. I don't see this as a mainstay in their concert set list, but it will be a building block to explore the genre in future releases. <laughs> In Lucembles Fresh Out the Oven Cotton Candy, we add that R&B I was talking about with New Jack Swing. This gives them a tiny bit of a brighter, more playful edge that suits their young ages, because they are still young, but it still fits with the overall darker atmosphere. As the final original song, we have Purple Kisses Joa, which I have decided would be called Like You. I decided that I wanted them to focus on acoustic ballads and slow songs because those tend to not be too emotional and, in my opinion, would help them ease into the stronger emotions as they gain experience. Joa serves as another building block for future releases. <laughs> While I personally think this album works well as its own release, I prefer to think of it as a teaser for what's to come. Wake One have never done a permanent group before, and these different styles and genres would allow them to figure out what to emphasize and lean into based on fan reception and what works for the group. We then have three bonus tracks, Fake It, Drip, and I Will Always Love You Isna versions. I'm a bit conflicted on if I want them to change the lyrics to I Will Always Love You and have the girls rewrite most of it as a group, thereby erasing Foucault's credit, or if I want Foucault to get her writing royalties. Double-edged sword, both would be bittersweet in their own ways. Anyways, after that we have a late winter, early spring release, assuming the debut is late October, November. I think we can safely place this first comeback around April. That's roughly six months. I would say we could aim for February even, if we want to try to guarantee none of the biggest competition will be releasing. Right now we have Espa, Islet, and Itzy in October, and La Seraphim just finishing their promotions. It's unlikely any of these will have comebacks in February or March, but Islet are a possibility in April due to their rookie status. We always run the risk of a group like Idol having a comeback, but with their strained relationship with Cube and their contracts starting to expire, there's still a question mark. So let's give ourselves that window of February, March, April. This comeback will be Act 2, Blank Verse. We're using some literature terminology here at first. We're gonna keep expanding on this sound, starting with our intro, which will be Ryu Sujong's Be Cautious, but renamed into Darkness. The intro really sets the tone for the atmosphere of this release, and ending on a whispered Be Cautious really gives it a strong transition into the title track. <laughs> I think this would be a great concept for them to have GIF teasers. Like, I can see Mai standing center frame with a continuous pour of sand falling from her hands. Everything still in the image but the sand. Like FX's Four Walls teasers. Jimin with wind dripping through a veil-like fabric draped over her. A new concept with Coco wearing a cowboy hat like Rujin and Not Shy with the dangling gems moving back and forth. There's a lot of potential here, guys. For the title track, we have Pink Fantasy's Shadow Play. Some people call it Middle Eastern inspired, others Moombaton esque Either way, it is exactly the style of music I personally envision would suit this lineup particularly well. It's confident, it's playful, it's dark, while in my opinion still allowing for more of an easy listening vibe rather than just straight powerful. I could see them filming a music video in Arizona or even somewhere in China. I know they have a desert, I just don't remember where. And that might be more economical. We're using drones. We're doing solo shots that play with shadows, pun intended. We're doing black and white choreography scenes, maybe even in water. Point is, we're going all out for this first comeback because we need that investment early on. But again, we're trying to avoid unnecessary comparisons. Our first B-side is Wekimeki's Metronome. This builds on the themes of the group itself by having more of a self-love lyrical theme. 
we have the house elements coming in strong to build up that side of their musical and identity. We also have a slightly brighter vibe, which listeners can take with them into the summer. Possibility for later music show promotions. In Assign Anonymous, which I have retitled Assign Hidden, we get to mix some of those house elements with the R&B I really want to include for Jiyoon in a contemporary R&B track. I don't have much more to say. Then for La Boom's Firework, we get a more acoustic version of that Latin-inspired sound I want, and I think this would be a great song for a special music video. Whether it's a special performance video or more of a self-filmed vibe with snippets from the girls during their first six months of activities, both would work. Following that is EXID's Too Good To Me. Some sites say electropop ballad, others call it two-step, whatever the genre is, I want it. Maybe the lyrical themes would be too complicated for them to accurately portray, but all that matters is that the song sounds like this. You are too good to me. Finally, the second mini ends with Dreamcatcher's Sahara. We're adding a bit of an edge to their discography. This would definitely be a song they can perform at award shows as support for the title track. It has the Latin guitar plucks, but then quickly evolves into a pop rock track with strong imagery. This is another track that builds on and expands their sound, allowing them more avenues to explore later on without alienating fans. <laughs> I lied a little bit, the actual final track is an outro track. Now, I usually am not a fan of putting outros on mini albums, but I'm putting this here less as a set in stone track and more like an alternative intro. Essentially, it's an intro that I think really works for the group, but I can't really justify replacing any other intros for it. It's Jiku's peep. I really had to stop myself from putting Moonlight as an option in this video. <laughs> Anyways, this outro, if it stays an outro, is called Cold. Okay, now we have Act 3, Sweet Life, named after the title track. This is a summer comeback. This is like a July to September release, depending on when we got the last one. We're staying within the same realm, but we're going a lot brighter. Ironically, our intro for this one is Hayes' Love Goes Around Comes Around, which is a lot jazzier than most of their discographies so far. It keeps the prominent guitar, but is definitely a lot calmer than the upcoming title track. Either way, this one is renamed to Indulgence. <laughs> As for the title track, we have Tribe's Loro, but I have renamed it Dolce Vita because I think that would have more impact and lend itself to more concept association. I think going for a bit of a Garden of Eden vibe, a little bit like Greek mythology vibe would be the move. Maybe even a Fountain of Youth motif? I think that could work. I think our best visual reference would be Twice Is More and More. The song is about repetition and following their words, so we could have a choreo with domino effects, mirroring, follow the leader moves, maybe a part where one of them does something different every performance and the others copy it. Something fun for the summertime. For the first B-side, we have Cherry Bullets Ready, but renamed to Crimson because I think it suits this group's vibe more. I need you guys to hear me out. This song, but pitched down by like two notes. It works. It's bright, it's summery, it focuses on innocent themes of unrequited first love, so most of them should be able to sell it. Maybe it won't be a fan favorite, but it lets them show they can stay within the same general sound without becoming one note and expected, which would keep it fresh. On that same note, we have Everglow's Untouchable, which brings us back to synth pop, a retro vibe throwing it all the way back to I Will Always Love You, but positive. This would be a song for Sebi, Jungin, and Sarang to really shine, in my opinion. They all did well in the sound and concept on the show, and overall, I think they did the best in it among the final members of the group. That doesn't mean the others are left out, but I would see this as the supporting B-side, which is where those three would really stand out. Also, all girl groups should have at least one song that's for the suffix. As the follow-up is the fan-dedicated song with GWSN's One and Only. I think it's Tropical House. It's definitely a house subgenre, so we get to keep expanding on that aspect of their sound while keeping it fresh for the summer. We're definitely releasing an official choreo practice video for this one, but I don't know if we're putting any more investment into it beyond that. Maybe we could have a fan dedicated self filmed music video to close off the era. Nothing. 
Now this one might be controversial. Not because the song itself is, but because of what I want it to represent. We have Red Velvet Sassy Me here, and it's going to be a dance unit song. So we only have Jimin, Coco, Mai, and Sebi on this one. Please hear me out. I'm expecting them to have developed enough as vocalists by this point to pull the song off. And I know some people would want Jungin and Sarang in this unit no matter what, but who would replace them in the vocal unit? Be honest. Speaking of which, we have Mamamoo's Words Don't Come Easy, a bossa nova song, which perfectly mixes the jazzy and Latin influences I want for this group. We are completely ignoring the lyrical content. For all we know, this song does not have lyrics. <laughs> Anyways, both unit songs will get their respective performance videos. I would expect the dance unit to get far more views and initial virality while the vocal unit would slowly gain in traction. But I do think both are options for viral moments on TikTok, Reels, and Shorts. If we want to, we can have them release a winter digital single. I'm thinking around December 16th. This is not a requirement, but I think it would be fun to release like... Winter Story, a special single with a limited edition physical CD or polka album. I have three song candidates and I would need at least two songs to justify a physical release. As the title track or main single, we have Mini Money's This Year Was Good. <laughs> then our two B-side candidates are either Uji Sanu's Closer To You or DSP Girls, You Are The One, sung by Jiyun, Jungun, and Sarang. If you don't use a winter release as an excuse to push your vocalist, what are you even doing? EXO gets it. Now you know an Into Orbit production wouldn't be complete without a full-length album. The next year we have Act 4, Truth and Lies, complete with a double title track or a pre-release, dealer's choice. The reason for this title is the duality of the album. In the first half we have the discovery of a lie, while in the second half we have an acceptance of your own truth. Kinda. We start with Nine Muse's Identity as the intro, where we get a healthy mix of guitar, electric guitar, a heavy heart reminiscent beat, an almost anthemic transition into synth wave and then a vocal moment carried by synths. giving you a sneak peek of what the album has to offer. In my head, I place this album in 2026, around February, March. Definitely a timing when the overall dark atmosphere gets to really be felt. As the first track, we have a B-side. This is AOA's magic spell, which I am going to call Spellbound. Despite being electropop at the core, the whistling in the background gives it a cowboy vibe to me. It gives them a little bit of a mature edge while still being playful, which is fitting given all the girls would be adults at this point internationally. There's nothing inherently mature in the song, it's just a bit of a vibe change. Kind of CLC black dress in a way. <laughs> Then we have the title track, or one of them if you're choosing the double title track route. The Latin influence is at its strongest, and the slight shift towards a more mature image comes through in the lyrics of Sonomu's I Knew It, which is a very, um, determined takedown of a toxic relationship. I know it. The genre is electro tango, so you know this music video has to have a ballroom vibe. I think we could get away with Jimin doing a tango scene with the masked dancer. We'll also have classic scenes like someone picking petals off a red rose, another girl pricking her finger on a thorn, I'm seeing black lace blindfolds, maybe throw in a full moon, some red wine. I have concepts of a plan here. That leads us to the second title or the pre-release favorites lie. I would need these two to have a continuous storyline between them so we have similar aesthetics. I would love a version of a connected music video like Idol with Allergy and Queen card where the story changes based on which you watch first. I honestly can't tell which would resonate more with fans. I think they're both great title track candidates. If it's a pre-release, then we're only talking about like a week's difference. If it's a double title track, it's released the same day, day before or day after. We keep going with Rumor, probably one of the most famous Moombathon songs in K-pop. It follows the theme of the album so far, with the narrator dealing with conflicting narratives. What's real? What's a rumor? Can the person just tell them it's all just rumors? Again, we're moving on to slightly more mature themes lyrically here.
That's followed by Daya's no, which continues the general Moonbaton vibe, in my opinion, but the internet refuses to tell me exactly what genre it is, so that might just be in my head. But it continues the lyrical theme of the album so far. This is actually coincidental, it's just that a lot of K-pop songs with Latin vibes have breakup themes in the lyrics. We're finally moving into the second section of the album with GWSN's Tweaks, which I'm calling Tweaks I Need Rain. They finally get some proper deep house into their discography, which I think could easily make this a fan favorite. That and the sudden shift towards more positivity, with the lyrics literally referencing a break in the clouds to welcome a rain of change, we're finally leaving the lies chapter. <laughs> Combining some rock influences with trap beats, we have Oh My Girl Swan, which I'm going to call Waves. Again, we're accidentally following some lyrical themes where the song almost sounds like a rebirth after a heavy rain. Girls' Generation greet us next with their dance slash funk pop explosive song Sweet Talk. Now we're on to the more confident side of the album, the truth side. Personally, I want to call this song big band inspired, which in turn makes it jazz inspired. That's really what I want from this track more than just an upbeat dance track. We continue that brassy jazz vibe into A Pink's Enough, which is a contemporary R&B track so it builds on what we established with A Sign. Again, the lyrics display a much more confident narrator. Honestly, it's a bit reminiscent of a mid-2000s, late 90s musical movie where the main character's best friend is confessing her feelings to her love interest. It's bold, yet soft, innocent, but mature, hesitant, and forward. I've got enough, 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 enough. Gugudan's dance pop track Do It may have been one of their last, but it will not be Isna's. It's a bit funky, bringing back the vibe from Sweet Talk. The lyrics combine themes heard throughout the album, such as in Tweaks. This could easily get a special performance video, be a concert highlight, even get performed at award shows. <laughs> The last full song of the album is Kiss of Life Says It. It's an acoustic ballad, so we're back to more vulnerable lyrics. I actually didn't want this to be the last full song on the track list. I wanted it somewhere around the middle, but the flow led us here. It works as a closer for the themes as well, with the lyrics asking the other person to speak their heart as they both know the truth. Time we can wait, only one thing to say, says in love. The last track of the album is the outro based on Sunny Hill's Prey preview, which we're calling Truth. Honestly, if it didn't have the guitar pluck and simple piano instrumental, says it wouldn't have been the last track. But this opens up the possibility for Isna to continue building on their sound and concept after the conclusion of this era. A full album exploring plenty of genres, and they can build on all of them. Now that this whole section is done, we can get into more realistic expectations, just activities and schedules I would expect to see Wake One get for the girls. I see no point in them specifically mentioning her popularity in China if they don't do anything with it. Sarak doesn't have a huge solid fan base among Korean or international fans, so getting her steady gigs in China like magazines and others of the sort would be integral to maintaining and growing that popularity. This would also benefit Isna in the long run as C-bars or Chinese fan bases tend to be the biggest source of album sales in K-pop. I also think Mai would do well as a model in China and the two of them could be the faces of Isna in China. One way to get your group out there and discovered is through K-drama OSTs. I believe Jungun and Jiyun especially could garner a lot of attention for Isna either through solo or duo OSTs. If the drama is popular enough, the OST might also chart really well. Examples of hit OSTs, Chanyeol and Punch Say With Me, Ailey I Will Go To You Like The First Snow, Joy Introduce Me A Good Person. The most popular OST on charts in 2023 was a decade old, released in 2013. This also helps people recognize their voices. Wake One definitely have the leverage to get Jimin and Coco on Artist of the Month. While the impact of the program has decreased, it would still help with promoting the Isna members' individual talents. Jimin especially could create buzz by appearing due to her pre-established popularity. Sebi, Jong, and Amai just aren't refined enough dancers yet to pull it off, but I could see them as well down the line. I, I, I if 
Mnet and Wake One don't use their influence to get Jungin or Sarang or Jimin a music show hosting gig, then I just have to wonder what the point even was. The reason why I think those three should get the gig is because one, Jungin ranked first, two, Sarang could grab attention with her visuals, and three, Jimin is the most recognizable member right now. One of them has to be a music show host, most likely on M Countdown, but we will accept any position that will be available within six months of debut. It is really important for their prosperity to establish themselves in Japan. Thanks to Kepler and especially Eyes One, Wake One has connections to help push them in Japan. Because they're a permanent group, they don't really need to rush a Japanese debut in order to establish themselves there, but it definitely needs to happen within the first two years of activities. If they debut in October 2024, they should debut in Japan by September 2026. If they're not really picking up momentum by the third release, then definitely sooner. You can think of the winter single as a placeholder for a Japanese debut, in my plans, if needed. But Japan is a huge market, it's a lot easier for K-pop groups to establish themselves there than in the US. Wake One has experience, they should know which member is the most popular in Japan and work that angle with CFs, magazines, variety show appearances, and other promotional activities. I'm honestly shocked we haven't been getting any pre-debut covers from the girls. Since they don't really have any activities except KCON and their first appearance failed, group and individual covers are a good way to keep the existing fan base engaged and to garner new fans who want to know them for their skills, not their survival show. I also think it would be so important to post dance practices of the songs they'll perform at KCON, even if they're all from Island. Now we need to move into a new section. We've talked a bit about what I want to see in these early years, but this section will focus on what I absolutely do not want to see. Debuting with a single album with one to three songs? Absolutely forbidden. That is setting us up for failure in the long run. Not because single albums don't work, but because that A is way too similar to YG's strategy. B makes the group far more likely to fall back on single albums leading to a Blackpink discography length, and C essentially traps them into multiple singles when they should have the resources to avoid that. If it means Wake One needs to cut the Black label off for some releases, then so be it. They should have never attached themselves to two groups debuting the same year if they can't let them debut with more than three songs. Absolutely no girl crush, I'm too good for you concept. Empowering songs, self-love, etc. Go nuts. But that concept is a huge no-no. All it will do is bring unwanted comparisons to YG groups and it's just stopped working. Very few people actually eat it up and these young girls can't sell it. Please just play it a little bit safe and let them debut with a love song. I don't even care if it's super cheesy and doesn't fit the girl crush image people were expecting. That just shows how stale YG and the Black Label are when it comes to concepts. Please just let Vivian take some charge here. These do not make them feel exclusive, it just kills their momentum. Even if they have a bit of a flop title track, there's no point in an extended hiatus unless someone's seriously sick. On that note, Putting them above some standard rookie promotions like doing challenges, variety, certain music shows, etc. also just makes them inaccessible to fans, the people who want to see them. Obviously, I'm not team overwork them. I'm just team let them be the most successful they can be. As of recording, they just had their first appearance at KCON Germany earlier today, and it seems Wake One is already running into some management issues. A really good way to kill a group before they even begin is by giving fans something to complain about immediately. I'm seeing complaints about their styling, which is warranted. I would recommend it going for a uniform styling, whether school or something else. Nobody can complain if they're all wearing the same thing. Yes, someone can still complain about it being a uniform and not styling to have them stand out, but it's still the better of the two. Hot take. It definitely feels like the stylist is treating Coco like Lisa was treated, like a styling guinea pig. They came on stage looking like they're competing in Dress to Impress and none of them understand the theme. There's some issues with the line distribution, but survival shows always lead to fans having issues with line distribution. Aside from that, there's complaints about them performing Love Sick Girls, but I do think that shows some promise with regards to them not going for the classic YG concept. Love Sick Girls may be YG, but it's not exactly what you think of when someone says YG concept, you know? They could have done I Am The Best, now that would have made me nervous. The only thing I fear right now is that their debut mini will have two original songs, maybe an intro, and then is filled out with show songs, including the Love Sick Girls 
Girls remix, pulling a Kepler, so to speak. But these are just my thoughts, feel free to share your own in the comments, respectfully of course. So I'll see you guys in the next one if I ever have the time to actually finish it. I do try to avoid this, but feel free to subscribe. My goal right now is to hit 10,000, which seems so far away, <laughs> because I want to be able to link my videos to YouTube giving for a good cause. In the meantime though, you can always help the world be a better place via the links in the description that I mentioned at the start of the video.